everybody here this morning, including the ones that are attending by Zoom. And if we could just bow in a word of prayer. Lord, I want to thank you this morning and uh, just being able to fellowship for the time being and just uh, ask that you would put your blessing on the service this morning. And Lord, it's always exciting when somebody gets baptized and I just lift it up to you this morning. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome. This is an exciting day for more reasons than one. Eh, Al? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Let us stand together as we sing, Who You Say I Am. Here in this church, we do by total immersion, and that's why there's water here, and Cali goes right under. 
And uh, we believe that that's what the Lord Jesus did, and we believe that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, in Matthew 3, 13 to 17, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. I like to think that every time somebody comes up out of this water, God says, This is my child, in whom I am well pleased. And that's what we're going to see today as we go forward. There's also the story of Philip and the eunuch, which is in Acts 8, 35 to 38, and I want to read that to you. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture from Isaiah 53, 7 and 8, and told him the good news about Jesus. As he traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave the order to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. When a baptism happens, it is a hallelujah event. I heard the, that uh, we were asking for a password when you come in to, to, for fun. Well, it's the word hallelujah, and you have to spell it. No, no. But that's what this event is. It's a rejoicing time. So when Kelly comes up out of that water, not only is she going to be excited for what she's done, but we should be rejoicing and celebrating with her. Because that's what it's really all about. Today, Kelly Nelson is telling you that she loves the Lord Jesus, that she's accepted his salvation, and she wants to go forward living for him. When we do a baptism, it is an outward sign of an inward change. It's already happened. All right? The decision is yours to make. And then the baptism, I like to say cements the deal. Uh, it makes it so that you just, everybody knows. Accountability is what baptism is also about. Kelly being baptized is saying to you, she expects that you're going to help her grow and help her become a better Christian as she goes along walking with Jesus. So when she struggles, when she stumbles, when she has problems, our job is to encourage her and lift her up and keep her going. It's also her statement to you that she's going to do the same for you, and that she's going to be praying for you and being there when you need it. So let's rejoice with Kelly as we go through this baptism. yourself this day that you may be baptized. Baptism is not itself a door to salvation, but rather is an outward sign of an inward change that God has brought into your life. It proclaims to your family, friends, church, that you have taken Christ as the Lord of your life, and that it is your purpose to walk and grow closer to Him. In order that we might confirm your story of what God has done for you, and that we may know that you understand the significance of the step you're taking, we want to ask you these questions. Do you believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? That Jesus Christ the Son suffered in your place on the cross, that he died and rose again, that he now sits at the Father's right hand until he returns to judge all men in the last day? And do you believe in the Bible as the inspired word of God? That by the grace of God, every person has the ability and the responsibility to choose between right and wrong, and that those who repent of their sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are saved? 
Do you intend by being baptized today to testify to all who are present that Jesus is the Lord of your life and your desire is to follow him? Kelly, it is my pleasure to do this. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I, I now baptize you in the, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I just want to thank the Lord for saving my life, and I want to thank all of you guys for just being here and sharing this special time of committing to the Lord. I just want to thank you for all your support here, and um, oh, I just can't express how thankful I am to the Lord of what he's done in my life. And I want to thank my husband for being such an encouragement and support of me and my sister is I just want to thank her for encouraging me for years to just stay with the Lord and thank you. Kelly told you that the only way she would say anything is if the spirit moved her. So I guess the spirit moved. So carry on with the music. Thank you. Let us continue to thank the Lord as we stand together.
that Kelly had uh, requested, I give you my heart and then the river. This is my desire to honor 
Take my 
opportunity to pray with Kelly just Val and I just before she came out. And uh, there's a lot of things when you get baptized, as Kelly was sharing, you know. And uh, I said to her, yeah, I can remember I was very young in, in this church when I got baptized. And the impact of that and for the years to follow but how different it would be now, at my age now, and how it would feel. And Kelly said, well, I'm just so emotional. And I said, oh, well, I would just be a mess. And I said, I don't think I'd be able to hold it together at all. But you did really well. And I appreciate Kelly because she's so genuine. We've had the opportunity to draw close to Kelly and, and Elle um, with our fellowship group and Bible study and stuff. So it's, it's been a, a good time. And hopefully sooner than later we'll be able to Candle back. So this morning I'd just like to uh, share a song for you, Kelly. And um, if there's anything that I struggle with, probably more so in, in my life, is my memory of remembering things. Um, and as we get older, that just gets more and more great as we get older. But there's one thing I, I shall never forget, and that's the day that I did give my life over to the Lord. And uh, so my prayer for you is that. Be steadfast, acknowledge him. And I think one of the most um, nearest and dearest scriptures that was given to me was to acknowledge him in all thy ways to acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path.
say what she did, I, I do believe that there was a movement of the Holy Ghost there for sure. Sorry. Sorry. So I'm going to start off with just a little bit about me first. Um, I was born here in Dawson, as many of you know. Uh, I was raised in the suburbs, more commonly known as Puskupi. <laughs> so I was raised in an alcoholic family. Um, my father was, was an alcoholic. He quit drinking when I was 10 or 11. And, uh, but the damage was done to my parents' marriage and they split up shortly thereafter. Um, at the age of 14 or so, my mom started dragging me into church. And at the age of 15, I gave my life to the Lord right in this very sanctuary. Um, and the following spring, was baptized right behind me here. So that's the special meeting that I have with Kelly, and it's, it's something that just means an awful lot to me. Um, it so uh, happens sometimes. In my late teens, I started to fall away from the Lord, and I can say without any doubt that he never fell away from me. He was always there. Um, after graduation, I decided there was a whole wide world out there and doggone it, I was going to go and see it. And uh, unfortunately, the money ran out in Prince George. So <laughs> that's where I ended up. <laughs> a couple years later, I was, uh, I was actually 20 years old and a buddy of mine had moved down from, from Dawson to Prince as well. And we were going to go fishing out by uh, Mackenzie, and somewhere between Prince George and Mackenzie Junction, we changed our minds and we decided to continue on up to Dawson and come for a visit. Unfortunately, we never made it. We uh, left the road um, just before the Heart Lake turn off by Mount Memorial at 140 kilometers an hour. The car went sideways into the ditch and hit a big boulder about three feet in diameter right behind the passenger front wheel. And according to police and RCMP, or the ICBC reports, that's when I was ejected. I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. I was so thrown some 250 feet down the ditch ahead of the car. Um, takeoff was okay, the landing hurt. Um, I was pretty busted up. The fact that I survived it was nothing short of miraculous. There was no possible way. That stretch of road actually to this day is actually a no stopping avalanche zone. So there, the ditch was littered with boulders. When I woke up, which was amazing, I woke up, I was laying between two boulders as if I'd been placed there. Um, I spent the next year and a half recovering from that. And you would think that would be enough to send me running back to the Lord, but it didn't. Um, it actually almost had an opposite effect on me. I began feeling somewhat invincible for some reason. It wasn't until several years later that I got married, um, had a little boy, 
and two years later was separated and my little boy was gone from me. I couldn't see him every day. It took me to the point of almost suicide. And then the Lord reached out and grabbed me. I'm so thankful he saved my life again. But then I had a problem because I couldn't really justify signing the divorce papers. So I lived for the next seven years, neither single nor was I married. I was caught in between in limbo. Looking back on it, I can see easily that the Lord, he knew exactly what I needed. And I needed every bit of that time to get my own life in order, in order to be able to move on. Um, it, was, it was an extremely difficult time. Finally, after about seven years, my ex had moved to, to Williams Lake and I had followed up there just so that I could be a part of my son's life and, and see him on a regular basis. And after about seven years, she approached me one day and said she had met somebody and she wanted a divorce. And, um, finally, I was going to be free, I felt, and it was an amazing feeling. About the same time, a friend of mine from the First Baptist Church in Williams Lake approached me and said, you know, I know this lady. She's a Christian. She's a single mom with two kids. Um, she goes to the Salvation Army Church, and I said, the Salvation Army is a church? I, <laughs> I didn't even know at that point that they were a church. Um, and he said, yeah, and I think you guys had hit it off really well. So I, uh, I, he gave me her phone number and said, call her. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I was a little out of practice, and to be honest, I was scared. So I didn't call. And two weeks later, and by now, I was only a few days away from actually signing the divorce papers. I did call her. And uh, we met, Kelly and I met the next day on a blind date. And the thing that impressed me the most about Kelly was how easily we were able to communicate. We could talk freely about everything. I learned that she had been born in Victoria and uh, moved to Vancouver. And uh, she uh, was raised in Vancouver, had spent some time in one church, but the real memory she has is actually at West Point Gray Baptist Church. Um, as a child, she was in the choir. She was. Uh, uh, go sunny, Sunday school and, and children's camp and her and her sister both were there and we're so pleased to have you here today Linda I just really appreciate you being here um, but they they often speak fondly of those memories and it's funny Linda mentioned actually that after 53 years Kelly has come full circle and she's back in a Baptist church which is kind of cool actually so we, we met, and she played hard to get for a while. Um, <laughs> but eventually, I, I was able to show her the error of her ways. And <clears throat> but uh, we started dating seriously. And, and uh, anybody who's ever blended a family together um, knows how difficult and challenging that can be. Uh, it was no different for us. Of course, I had my son from a previous marriage. Kelly had two kids from a previous marriage. So we spent, we really took our time. It was a couple of years. I was fortunate to have um, my stepdad actually once said to me some words that I never forgot. And they were this, they, he said, I'm not your dad and I'm not going to try to be your dad. But if you'll allow me to, I will always love you 
as if you were my son. And I never forgot those words, and they really stuck with me, and I really tried to live up to what he gave me. Um, the same with Kelly's kids, and, and it, was, it was tough. But we were finally on December, just before Christmas, 1998, I got down on one knee and asked Kelly to marry me. And there's some debate as to whether she said yes or not, but I got a ring on my finger that says she did. So <laughs> she brings this up once in a while. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> she never actually said yes. Um, hey, what can I say? Uh, so then we started planning a wedding. and. Uh, the Salvation Army in Williams Lake at that time was just a, a rockin' church. Um, how Kelly ended up back at the Salvation Army is actually a really neat story. She ended up living in Williams Lake, and one of her kids, Crystal, met one of the officers from the Salvation Army's kids, and they became best friends. And it's neat how the Lord just used that to bring Kelly eventually back to the Salvation Army. Um, Crystal began attending Sunday school and then Gary was right behind her and then uh, soon enough Kelly was attending church there as well. Uh, just, But that was the Beverage family was their names but then a young couple by the name of, of Danielle Strickland and Stephen Court took over. Danielle um, is, they're both just dynamic speakers and they both are uh, amazing musicians and they had that little church just hopping. It, it kind of reminded me of the old Solomon days, you know, <laughs> it just really did. It, it was, that place was jumping and it was full and there was just, it was really a, a neat place to go to church. And so she converted me. She drug me away from the Baptist, and, and uh, I started attending the Salvation Army with her, actually. So when we were getting, decided to get married, we asked Danielle to, to marry us, uh, which she graciously said yes. So we had to, at that point, we had to go through the dreaded marriage counseling, which I don't know if anybody else has gone through that, but... It's, it's so much fun. <laughs> but at one point, we were, we were filling out a questionnaire, and we, we actually were put in separate rooms, and we're filling out this questionnaire. And I don't remember a lot of the questions on it, but the one in particular that I do remember was this. It said, when people look at your marriage, what do you want them to see? And Kelly and I, to the best of my knowledge, had never discussed that. We had never actually talked about it. But when we came back together and compared our answers, we had both answered that question almost word for word identical. And we said that when people look at our marriage, we want them to see that when God is truly at the center of a marriage, nothing can tear it apart. We had no idea um, how quickly or severely that was going to be put to the test. Um, so we went ahead, well, I shouldn't say we, Kelly planned the wedding. She made, she's really good at making me feel like I had a part of it, but I, I really, I didn't, so <laughs> didn't have much anyways. But she, uh, we, we planned the wedding for April 3rd of 1999. And uh, it, was, it was an amazing ceremony, um, just, just an amazing day. It almost went off without a hitch, except for somebody forgot the rings. I don't know who that was, but I might have forgot the rings. My, my stepdad actually went Mach 1 back to my house and got the rings and brought them down to the church while Kelly was waiting. She was there on time. So uh, we, we were married, and the plan was to go on a 10-day honeymoon in, on Vancouver Island, and we... 
were able to stay in some amazing places. It was off season, so we were able to stay in some places that you just couldn't afford if you were to stay there any other time. They were just beautiful in Tofino and, and Parksville uh, are the two that really stick out to me and I remember well. The plan was for me to come back from the honeymoon and I was supposed to go straight back to work. So we got back and, and I called my boss and said, I'm ready, ready to go back to work. We had spent a lot of money because both of us, it was really important that we have a full all out wedding. So we did the whole thing, the, the wedding, the, the reception, the honeymoon. We never spared any, any cash. Um, both of us had been married by JPs the first time around and the church wedding was something that was just really, really important to us. By the way, we were actually married by the Salvation Army officer in a First Baptist church. So once again, we're tying it all together. <laughs> but but uh, it was really important to us. And so money was getting a little tight. Kelly at the time had a very successful cleaning business that she was running and doing really well with, fortunately because I got back and called my boss and he said, nope, can't go to work. I don't have a permit for the job yet. And what my job was supposed to be was out in Fox Creek, Alberta. They had a log yard that was full of logs and my job was to run a processor and go and process these logs. And that was supposed to be my breakup job. And he, for whatever reason, was having trouble with permits. And he said, I've never experienced this before. I can't explain it. I, can't, I don't know why I'm having these problems. So I made the best of it for the next month or so. I actually spent a lot of time with my new son, uh, Gary. We, we built a fence together because the boys both got dogs when we moved in together. And uh, we spent a lot of time just doing guy stuff. And it was, it was really cool. I really felt that not only um, had I gained a beautiful bride, but I'd also gained a son and daughter. And it was just the real cool time for me. So finally, on May 26th, I got the call that I could go back to work. So on the 27th, my truck was loaded and I was heading from Williams Lake to Fox Creek, Alberta, which is a 10 hour drive, something like that. Nine if you hurry. Um, on the 28th, I worked a 14-hour day, it felt so good. It, it was just amazing to be back at work and, and I was excited about it. And uh, I got back to the hotel at about nine o'clock that night, had something to eat, fell into bed, and I think I was out by 9.30. At 10 o'clock, the phone rang and it was Kelly. And all she could say was, it's my worst nightmare. It's my worst nightmare. I finally got out of her what had happened and she said that Gary had been in a car accident and the hospital had called and told her she needed to get there right away. When they found out that she was by herself, they decided to send a police officer to pick her up. So she was waiting for the officer to get there. Um, she kept saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And all I could think of was call Danielle, the Salvation Army officer who had just married us. I said, call Danielle and then call me back. I threw my bag into the truck, turned out onto the highway and put my right foot firmly on the floorboards. I actually learned that night that my truck was governed at 160 kilometers an hour. Um, Kelly called back and we were praying together and there was a pounding on the door and 
She said, the police must be here. And she went to the door and answered the door. And it was our daughter, Crystal. And she was screaming, he's dead, he's dead. Gary's dead. I heard Kelly saying, no, he's not. He's not in good shape, but he's not dead. He's in the hospital. It turned out there was, there was a boy killed in that same accident that night, and they had mixed the um, IDs up. And Crystal was just up the road at a friend's house whose dad ran a tow truck company, and she heard it over the two-way radio, over their scanner, the police scanner that uh, Gary had passed at the accident scene. I can honestly say I've never felt that helpless in my entire life as what I did at that moment. Um, within moments, the, the police car did arrive to pick Kelly up and take her, to the, take her to the hospital. And I remember getting off the phone with her and having quite the conversation with God and saying, this can't be real. This can't be happening. How, how is this happening? You, this, can't, this can't happen. I remember saying, I survived that horrible crash. He's going to survive too, right, God? Like, he's got to survive this. And then I remember feeling very numb and just super hyper-focused on just driving and which was a good thing because I wasn't going slow. I was about 30 or 40 kilometers out of uh, Valmont and Kelly called me and she was at the hospital and she said it wasn't looking good that uh, Gary was in really bad shape. They were taking him for a CAT scan and going to be checking to see if he had any brainwave activity. I, I was just heartbroken. Um, I asked Kelly, I said, is Danielle there? And she said, yeah, actually she is. And, and she told me a story when, I, when she came in. And I have to share it with you. And I said, well, what was that? And she said, when she was coming through the parking lot of emergency, she saw a group of ladies standing in a circle, holding hands. And they were praying. She said, I don't, I don't know who any of them are. We found out later, a couple of months after, that it was a women's Bible study at one of the local churches. And after the Bible study, these women had gone to Tim Hortons and were having a time of fellowship. They saw the ambulance go out to get Gary. They saw the ambulance come back into town and they felt the overwhelming urge, the need to go to the hospital and pray. They had never done it before but yet they felt that overwhelming urge. I really, really, truly believe with all of my heart that God was simply saying, I'm here. Even now, I'm here. After that, um, Kelly said, there's a victim services worker here that wants to speak with you. And I said, okay, fine, put her on. And she started asking all kinds of stupid questions, like how fast was I going, um, what I was driving, what color it was, I, where I was. And I just answered all the questions, and she, I, I admit I lied. I told her I was doing 120. Um, I was going a little faster than that. She told me that I needed to slow down and that I needed to get there safely. I said, yeah, okay, whatever. I was coming into Valley View and um, 
Valley View at the time went from 100, and, well, 100 kilometer zone at night to 90 or to 80, and then down to 60 as you went by the Peace River turnoff. And I had just come into the 60 zone when I looked and saw the police car sitting on the side of the road. I looked at my speedometer and I was doing about 120 Ks. And uh, I just hit the brakes and then I knew I was, I actually, the thought that went through my mind was this is gonna be very expensive. Um, <laughs> amazing what goes through your head at that point. So I pulled over and on come his lights and, and he pulled in behind me and and he come up to the window and by the time he got there I already had my license and registration in my hand. I was wanting to give it to him and just get on the road again as quick as I possibly could. And he first thing out of his mouth was, are you Alan Nelson? And I've been pulled over enough in my life to know that that's not how the conversation normally starts. Um, I said, yes, I was. And he said, I've heard about what happened. And I know if it was me, I'd be hurrying too. He said, but I also hear that there's a lady there who really needs a hug. Get home safe, okay? Carry on. It was one of the first of many acts of kindness that we experienced over the next little while. I made it to Grand Prairie and had to stop for some fuel and I pulled into the um, shell bulk plant in Grand Prairie and fueled up and I decided that I would call the hospital to see how things were going. And it was then that I found out that Gary wasn't going to make it and Kelly and I had to have the conversation that no parent should ever have to have, and that's the one about organ donation. Danielle got on the phone afterwards, and she was just absolutely amazed at the strength of my wife. Kelly has said since then that, that she really felt that God was carrying her. Because one by one, in small town, a lot of Gary's friends had showed up at the hospital. And one by one, she took each one of them in to say goodbye. Anybody who wanted to go. I, I think back on that and I think of the strength that that took. Um, and that shows you a little bit of who this person is that got baptized here today. She's got an amazing heart for God and, and uh, the Lord carried her through that. When I left Grand Prairie, I was literally crying so hard I couldn't see the road in front of me. And at one point there was a moose standing right in my lane. He was just standing there, hanging out, I guess. And I swear to this day that the brakes on that pickup applied before I have ever hit the brake. I don't know that, but <laughs> it just seemed like I was being protected for sure. My dad at the time was living in Poos, and uh, I called him Beaver Lodge or so, and he insisted that I stop. I wasn't going to. My plan was just to keep it pinned and head for home. And, but my dad, even at 70 years old, could stop me in my tracks if, I, if he wanted to. And uh, so I did, and by the time I got there, my stepmom and him had had a bunch of sandwiches made up and a couple thermoses of coffee, and my dad actually drove me the rest of the way to Williams Lake that night. Um, we spent most of the next uh, week planning a funeral and for a 16-year-old boy, which is difficult to say the least. Um, sorry. The 
So in that week, one of the great things that happened during that week was we, our, we had a big house at, the, at that point. We had, we had three kids between us that were there all the time and, and family all the time. And so our house was quite big and family started arriving from out of town. And of course there was three different, four different families involved and everybody started coming to our place. And uh, our place was the gathering place for for everybody before the funeral happened. One of the coolest things that happened was one one morning, I think it was day two or three, there was a phone call and it was one of the ladies from the church, from the Salvation Army, and she said, how many people are at your house today? I thought, okay, that's odd. But I told her, I think it was 12. I said, there's 12 people here. She said, okay. Thank you, and she hung up the phone. And I thought, man, that's, that's different. At five o'clock, the doorbell rang, and in comes a full three-course meal. They put it out on the table. Everybody sat down and ate. They cleaned it up, and they left. And they did that every day for the next nine, ten days until after the funeral was over and everybody was gone home. And it, I can't even begin to tell you how much that meant to us. It, it was amazing. Um, and it's why uh, Kelly and I really do feel that being a part of a church family is so important and why it is so important to be a part. Um, we know what that support feels like. We truly do. I was honored to be asked by the family to give Gary, Gary's eulogy. I can tell you it was the single most difficult thing I've ever done in my entire life. Um, I, I spent hours over that next few days sitting out on the sun deck writing and rewriting this eulogy. A couple days before the funeral, Danielle called and we had asked Danielle to do the funeral for us. And she called and she said, there's a couple of things we need to discuss. One is, every indication is we got to pick the biggest church in town for this funeral because there's going to be a lot of people there. So we did. Um, Bethel uh, was much like the Bethel that's here. Uh, I'm not sure what their seat, seating capacity is, but the one in Williams Lake was 420 people. So we, I said, yeah, okay, and I, you know, I'll call the pastor, no, no problems. And she said, the other thing is, she said, I may never in my career get to speak to this many kids in one place at one time. Would you mind if, we, if I preached a salvation message? I remember wanting just to say, no, no, you, by all means, preach a salvation message. I went to Kelly and we actually called her back and said, we'd be fairly disappointed if you didn't preach a salvation message. Um, so we give her the permission to do that. The day of the funeral, I remember getting up and standing behind the pulpit and looking out at this church, and it was full. There wasn't an empty seat in the house. As a matter of fact, there was people standing in the foyer. It was amazing how many lives this young man touched. All I could say is, wow. You know, it was just wow. So I finished the eulogy and then Danielle got up and she delivered, she talked about Gary first and, and she talked about how he had given his life to the Lord and we knew where he was and we knew that without any doubt that we were going to see him again. And she preached a very simple salvation message, the one we all know. And then with her 
arm outstretched towards Gary's casket, she said, if this was you, if this was you today, where would you be right now? Where would you be? If you're not ready to make that decision today, if not now, when? If not now, when? It was um, powerful beyond belief. I do not do it justice the way um, she brought that across. The ladies from the church actually did a luncheon. They actually, they looked after everything after Gary's service. And I could literally sit here for the next hour and tell you, don't worry Terry, I won't. Um, <laughs> But I, I could sit here for the next hour and tell you the different uh, people whose lives were affected by that service that day. But one of my favorites was a 16-year-old girl whose um, life was going off the tracks in a big way. Her parents were Christians, but she was heading down some pretty rough road. and. Uh, immediately after the service she went home and she said to her mom I got to get right with God and they got down on their knees and they prayed together I was just I it still just sends shivers down my spine thinking about that we heard many many stories like that um, there was we, we learned after the, after the fact that the first responder on, on scene of the accident that night was a police officer who was a Christian, strangely enough. And uh, he said, I did something that night that I've never done before, and we weren't even aware that this had happened. But he walked up to check Gary's pulse, and Gary stopped breathing. And he did CPR on Gary until the ambulance got there and they were able to revive him. And I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but to me it was a huge thing because he was still alive when Kelly got to say her goodbyes. And I will be forever indebted to that police officer for that. He said he had never done it before. He had never ever once had he ever done CPR on anybody at a, at a crash site. But that day he did. Just amazing. Another one of my favorite stories, and I'm going to wrap it up here, but one, another one of my favorite stories was we walked out of the bank one day, and uh, we got used to people seeing us and doing an about face, and they would go the other way. They, they literally would just turn and run. They didn't want to talk to us, and I get it. I, you know, what do you say, right? Like, it, it's hard. It's, it's, they weren't bad people. I'm not saying that by any means. They just didn't know what to say. So we got used to people actually turning and walking away from us or pretending they didn't see us. And, and uh, this one day, though, we were coming out of the bank, and this lady who I didn't know come marching right up to us. And she, I, I thought, this is weird. Like, this is, this is odd. This doesn't happen very often. It turns out that she was a lady that Kelly had been taking some classes at the college with. And I didn't know her at all. But one thing, if any of you haven't had the opportunity to talk to my wife, you don't have to talk to her very long before the Lord starts coming into the conversation. Like, it's just, it's in her nature, it's who she is, the Lord just bubbles out of her, and I'm thankful for it. So apparently she had been witnessing to this lady in this class. So this lady came marching up and, and looking Kelly right in the eye and getting right into her space, she said, you know, you told me that you prayed for your children's safety every night. What happened? I can honestly say I have never hit a woman in my life, 
but so help me, I wanted to lay her out. Like, <laughs> I was ready to punch her in the nose. And I felt Kelly squeeze my hand. She was holding my hand and she squeezed my hand and it was a squeeze that said, I've got this. And she looked the lady in the eye and she said, and keep in mind, this is two months, less than two months after Gary died. She looked her in the eye and said, you know what, I can't explain this, but I have this overwhelming sense that maybe this was God's way of protecting him. Maybe this was, uh, maybe there was something so terrible coming that this was God's way of protecting him. I've never heard a greater statement of faith in my entire life than that. I, I thought, here is a mom in the throes of grief and she never once wavered. Her faith never once wavered. I am so proud to call her my wife. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up. I'd love to tell you guys that since then everything has been just peaches and cream. Uh, that wouldn't be true. We've, we've still had lots of ups and downs, but the one thing I know is that God is making us into the people, Kelly and I, and the couple that he wants us to be, and for that I am so thankful. We've experienced these, these tragedies, but we've also been able to share with other people, other parents who are going through something like that. We've been able to help other people through similar situations. And the thing that I can say with absolute certainty, the one thing that I know beyond anything, is that when God, when he is at the center of a marriage, nothing can tear it down. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Kelly. For our closing song this morning, we'd like to do What a Friend We Have in Jesus. So let us stand together as we sing.
first verse as the last. you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation this is the prayer Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord I pray for you for forgiveness and blessing for your forgiveness and blessing for in your flesh and sacrifice were the crooked made straight and the sinful cleansed baptize me again in your glory and let me begin again in your eyes Lord pure as a lamb. Amen. Just remember that God is the most strongest being around. Absolutely. Have an awesome week.